Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Siouf. I did my thing as I said in Ohio State University. And I'm really happy to have uh, some of my attendees here with us joining us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, urine metabolic finding uh, and involuntary metabolism. I will step down because I wanna, we're going to be looking at a lot of my eyes. We uh, use more of uh, uh, ABC in the MRI in our department, just uh, to make sure you know we are all at the same page. So uh, our ABC in the MRI is uh, the first one we, see. we consider every MRI in the neurometabolic disorder is abnormal until proven otherwise. Guilty until proven honest. And the reason for that, we want every patient or every doctor to dig into the MRI looking for finding. As Dr. Muhammad Jan said a few minutes ago, it is really important to look at the MRI because it can give you a very big, huge indicator and direct you to the right diagnosis. Second, MRI is strained with its twist and tear. So if you find an abnormality, please rest if you must, but do not stop. And the reason for that, if you have one pathology, two pathology, look for more pathology. And to emphasize this more, I'm going to have to say it in different language. And excuse my accent. No say dikeniemi. This is in Spanish. Do not stop. Nicht zu stoppen in German. Do not stop. It's very important to keep looking for another pathology. Ne vous avez which is in French. Don't stop, please. And botchioch is in Chinese. Don't stop. Now, third, bias and prejudice are attitude to be kept in hand, not attitude to be avoided. What do I mean by that? If I have an EEG that shows the right posterior quadrant abnormality, please look at the right posterior quadrant abnormality because you might find the abnormality and you can bypass it as if nothing did. And we, we deal with this all the time. So, to also emphasize the importance of looking at the MRI, if I don't look at the MRI, it is not true. Every single MRI, every single patient I see, I look at this MRI. And all, all the residents working with us, they know we look at every single MRI of the patient we see. And it is not uncommon, we find abnormality. This is, has led to the innovation of MRI of, of Al-Mahra Hospital. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. Now, males and females have equal brains, so this, this one here is wrong. And please stay safe in the MRI. Uh, you see this is an uh, incident in the MRI. You know, I really can't tell you what can you do about this, but make sure you have your uh, bed belt on in case you need to fly. The MRI or the number of hospital, most of our residents know that. They, they have to do the work. There's no other way around it. It is, I swear to God, I will look at every patient's MRI, the whole MRI, and nothing but the MRI. <laughs> Again, to emphasize, you really need to look at your MRI. That's a very important slide. This is a very important slide. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. You know, it, this is a very important slide. My departure is represented by low signal in two weighted images. As you see here, this is an adult T2 weighted image, the myelin look black, and this is the adult brain, and it looks white on T1 weighted images, you see, here, so you can, this is an adult brain, T2, black is white matter, lipa is gray matter, the opposite on T1, the opposite of that, to confuse you more, if you look at the white matter here, it is, uh, uh, if you look at the white matter area here, it is white because there's no myelin uh, right after a newborn kid. And in T1 in T here, in T2 here, in T1, in T1 here, you see there's the, it's a black and there's some myelination here. And going through stages from newborn until adult, we can tell if there's a delayed myelination, uh, a proper myelination, or demyelination. Myelination is central to peripheral, cowbell, terostral, dorsal to ventral. This is a general rule. Now look at this MRI. This is a one-year-old boy. We just saw him last week. And uh, you know, we looked at the MRI. 
what if uh, Dr. Dina showed us the MRI? And uh, you see, يعني, it is a delayed myelination because you should have more myelin, the anterior, uh, anterior capsule and the posterior capsule should be myelinated. You should see more darkness here. So there's delayed myelination. There's generalized brain atrophy. And then I told him, this is delayed myelination, general brain atrophy. But if you don't do nebuzavity, you're going to miss that. And this is was the main problem why this patient was paralyzed on the right side. I was not moving. And the rest of the main significant finding, we found one more of an incidental finding. And this is the T1 awakened image. Now, I find this, uh, you know, a myelination uh, table is really very helpful. In the first year here, I only look at T1 for myelination. For example, at six months, the corpus callosum has, be, has to be myelinated. At four months, the cerebellum has to be myelinated. And here, brain achieved adult appearance in T1 by one year of age. In the second year of age, I would use more the T2 here because it always lag behind to assist the myelination. Now, let's talk about some terminology we use in the, in the, in the lecture. This is T2. This is, is more of a terminal zone after you finish your myelination. There will be a white spot. This is called terminal zone. Here, what we call is, what do you call this one here? U5. Keep it in mind because we're going we're gonna, to we're talk about this a lot. And this is the deep gray matter and this is the superficial gray matter. I want you to, this is the caudate nucleus. You tell me the globus bellidus is here. Putamin, globus validus, posterior lymphatic capsule, and kilo lymphatic capsule, thalamine, and of course this is the, the, the lateral lymph. Now this is a, an MRI of a newborn. You see the Mickey Mouse. This is uh, the cerebral reduction. It is myelinated because in T1 it looks whiter. And if you go up, you see the posterior capsule is also posterior limb of internal capsule is also myelinated. That will tell us this is more of a normal brain MRI. And if you go up further, you will see the Rolandic area also has a, a, a touch of myelination. So this is a typically normal MRI of the newborn. If I can see the posterior limb of the internal capsule myelinated at birth, I would really follow this kid close because he might have a big problem down there. This is a little slide. I really apologize for that. But looking at the MRI and looking at the neurometabolic disorder is really very complicated. There is so many classification and there is so many inborn areas of metabolism with, with a lot of abnormality in the MRI. That is a lot of the time it's overlapped, so you cannot separate it. But if I, I picked up this algorithm because it gives you more of a pattern recognition and you busy daily practice. I look at the MRI, I use this algorithm and it will help me big time to know my differential diagnosis. This is more of a white matter demyelination or dismyelination. The T2, the, the white matter of T2 will be hyper, the C signal will be high, and T1 will be low. Here, hypermyelination, if you look at the MRI of a six month old kid, his, his myelination is more of a two months old, or he has like a little decreased signal on T1 and blurring of the margin between the, between the white matter and the, and, the, and, the, and the gray matter, and that will show you image. Now, I decided this kid has more of a uh, local dystrophy, it's a kind of demyelination, dismyelination, then I would go this route. I would go, is it confluent? And if it is confluent, or is it multifocal? If it is confluent, is it supratontoria, frontal predominant, periventricular, is it diffuse cerebral, is it subcortical predominance, or parietal occipital, or is it posterior fossa? This is supratontoria above the cerebellum, and if you down here to posterior fossa, cerebellum, and cerebral, cerebral pedunctal, a brain stem. That makes your life much easier. We are talking here about dismyelination or demyelination. If it is hypermyelination, and then I'm going to show you guys examples. You see no typical, with no typical peripheral nervous system involvement. This is the list. With typical peripheral nervous system involvement, this is the list. 
I know it's busy. We'll go through it uh, one by one. By the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the lecture, if you keep in mind metachromatic reproduction, you will give you periventricular, symmetrical, diffuse, white matter abnormality. As we look at this, in a typical pathway, it's parietal Taliban disease, symmetrical bilateral, involving the new type we talked about earlier, and then examine this is the frontal predominance. Uh, that's probably, uh, uh, would be, uh, I, I, I think I would be doing a great job. Now, here, this is what I mean. This is, if you look at the signal here in, 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 in T1, the white matter is really bright, very bright. And on the, on the, on the, uh, this is in, in T2. In T1, it is hypothesis. This is more likely R number one, demyelination, demyelination, and not hypomyelination. The hypomyelination, you look here, you know, there is, the, there is not, this is about two, two years eight, there is not full myelination. This all area should be black. This is not, what, it's more dirty. And you look at T1, it looks more normal, but it is lagging behind more of like, you know, six or seven months of old uh, demyelination. That is what we call hypermyelination. Then we'll go to route number two. Okay, now in my eye characteristic, we decided the kid uh, to have uh, 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 this myelination, demyelination, and it's a frontal predominance. And these are the disorders where you can have a frontal a predominance, uh, uh, lipodystrophy. We're going to talk about Alexander disease. Alexander disease is an autosomal dominant disorder. It is caused by criminal reproduction or criminal it is caused by demutation of GFAP. There is five criteria to diagnose uh, uh, Alexander disease. If you guys look down here, which is 99% of the time we don't do, is the contrast. In evaluation of leukodystrophy, we almost never do contrast. But if you see how important it is to do contrast, we would add contrast in every patient with uh, with a uh, with leukodystrophy. Okay, there are five criteria in my eye today for Alexander disease, according to Van der Kian. Extensive cerebral white matter with a frontal predominance. If you compare this area here, in comparison to this area here, it's more predominant. Even though it's subtle, but definitely more predominant. That criteria number one. Periventricular rim with high signal on T1, as you guys see here. High signal in T1. And what is the area, what is the area of board here? The peripheral area is the optic radiation area. So it is high in T1, it is low in T2, that's the criteria number two. If you have a very ventricular, if you have a signal abnormal to the swelling or boldness on the basal ganglia and the aloma, look at the caudate nucleus here, it is so wide, you know, you cannot even uh, separate it from the lateral ventricle uh, CSF signal. So that's criteria number three. Brain stem signal abnormality, as you guys see here, look at the, at the red nucleus, beautiful, but abnormal, unfortunately. And contrast is enhancement of one of the more of, of the problem, one or more of the problem, either the brain stem, you see the enhancement here, or enhancement of the of the of the periodical area. If you find four out of five, you almost got your diagnosis without doing the genetic test. Now we are still in the, in the desmyelination, demyelination, and we decided it's a confluent. We, go, we went to the periventricular predominance, and this is the disorder that causes periventricular predominance. And we're going to talk about metachromatic leukodystrophy and the Crabbe disease. Crabbe disease is an autosomal recessive disorder, lysosomal disorder. It affects the symptom and the peripheral nervous system. It is this minus or demyelination. This is why it should be hyperindense on T1, hyperindense in T2. You see here, <coughs> the deep cerebellar and nuclei would be involved early in the disease. And it gives you also periventricular predominance. And one thing here, what is this structure here? Optic optichiasm, hypertrophy. And if you look at the optic nerve here, it's also hypertrophied. This is can also be seen in Crabbe disease. If you find this finding, 
uh, uh, you should be uh, thinking about uh, Krabbe's disease. And remember here, the subcortical new fibers are spared until late in the Krabbe's disease. Metachromatic leukodystrophy, I think this is the diagnosis we, we think most of it when we see patients. It is a lysosomal storage disease caused by decreased activity of adult sulfatase A, less than 10 percent of normal. It is an autosomal recessive assay of adult sulfatase A. Sometimes might not give you the answers, though you have to definitely do one of these other two testing, either the molecular testing or urine excretion of sulfatides. There's a three, four, later one time, juvenile or other. And the subcortical fiber are stayed until late in the disease. If you guys look here, the white matter in the periventricular area is involved and uh, it is symmetrically involved around the lateral ventricle and that's typical of metachromatic reproduction. Now we are going to go to the parietal occipital area. It's a confluent, it is dysmyelination. We want that down to parietal occipital area and we're going to talk about the prototype that causes such abnormality as X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. It's a peroxosmal disorder affecting the central nervous system and adrenal cortex. There's a three forms. Childhood onset, the most common form, Addison disease only, or adrenomyeloneuropathy. If you have an adolescent or even a young adult who start to have dysplastic paraparesis, you please do me a favor, do your center a favor, do the patient a favor and get very low chain fatty acid. Because this is one of the might one of the progressive disorders. If you look at the MRI here, there is signal abnormality involving the cortical spinal tract. And if we keep going up, look at the parietal occipital area, it's heavily involved. At this cut, you cannot tell the CSF from the white matter, which is very typical for leukodystrophy secondary to dysmyelination or demyelination, not for hypomyelination. This is most likely consistent with adrenal leukodystrophy. And this is the same cut, look at the cut here, more anterior. This is a coronal T2 section. Almost there is nothing. If you go back, look how extensive is the abnormality. That is very typical of uh, adrenal leukodystrophy. Now we are still in this arm, in the confluent demyelination, dysmyelination, supratentorial area. And we're going to talk about the subcortical predominance. And in the subcortical predominance, we're going to talk about Fearns Serre syndrome and Canavan disease. Canavan disease is an autosomal recessive. This is probably the prototype disorder that the new fibers are involved in. If you see this picture here, please think about Canavan disease. There's other differential, but please think about uh, Canavan disease. You see the subcortical new fibers here are really involved. Diffuse symmetrical bilateral involvement of the white matter that is involving the U fibers, and also, if you also look here, it involves the globus calidae, that's very typical of Canavan disease. If you have a patient, and you do an MRI, and the MRI looks like this, you can always just go ahead and do target testing for Canavan, instead of doing like, you know, a 10,000 dirham, a multiple thousand dirham investigation. Here also, if you look at the MR spectroscopy, the n acetyl aspartate, this is the normal, but look here, it is really peak. This is also typical for Canavan disease, but, and thought at time it is a pathognomic, but it tend to be uh, more for uh, ML, it can happen with Bilesius, Merzbacher, and Salad disease. Now we're going to talk about Karen Sayerson. It's a triad, progressive external of thalamplegia, which is usually typical. You have typical retinal pigment and degeneration, salt and pepper, and half blood. So clinically, this will direct you to care cell syndrome. And if it is a sporadic, it's a mitochondrial disorder. If you do muscle biopsy, you will find, you will look, see the red, red triad. As you guys see here, see it? This is typical look of ragged red fiber. And if you look at the MRI, the subcortical white matter is very involved. Look here. But look at the deep, deep 
Why it happens is almost this big. This is very typical of current cell syndrome. If you see this one, you probably made your diagnosis. Now we are going to talk about diffuse cerebral, a confluent dysmyelination or demyelination disorder. And the prototype, probably in this category, is with MLC, megalocephalic lipoencephalopathy, with subcortical cyst. If you see it once, you probably can diagnose it right away next time. Childhood attacks are with simple hypermyelination, or what we can do, vanishing white matter disease. Okay, MLC, as you guys see, it is an autosomal cyst. It is secondary to MLC1 mutation. The MRI is characterized by diffuse, abnormal, and mild swollen cerebral white matter. Look here. This is not the typical look for the white matter. Look also here. That is more of a very bright look of white matter. But if you look deep, you will see the subcortical cyst. This is a very typical, extremely typical FMLC. And there's also another disorder that can cause that in the MRI. Anyone knows? Well, the co-factor. And what, what is the third differential on this also? Severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Can give you a molybdenum co-factor and MLC and the severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy can cause a similar look. Mm -hmm. This is the these are the cyst. Now vanishing white matter disease. If I if I cover the name here and I tell you, look at this guy, what do you think this this is the abnormal? Uh, the abnormality or the leukodystrophy. Caliban disease. Typical look like caliban disease. So it does look like caliban disease, but it is, uh, it is also autosomal recessive. It has a tax specificity and variable optic atrophy. If you guys look here, this is the optic layer. Usually, if you want to look for optic atrophy, you usually have to do ophthalmological examination, but on coronal cut, you can see the optic layer much better. Subcortical involvement occurred during early stages of the disease, just like caravan disease. You see the U-fibers or the subcortical area are involved. And also, very characteristic dorsal forms, hyper intensity seen at the beginning, as you guys see here. It just shifted a little bit down. You see these two dots here. This is dorsal forms, hyper intensity. And this is why I said, if you want to look at the MRI in a neurometabolism or the patient, look one, once, twice, and up to 10 times. Because you can miss this big part easy if you don't look carefully for that. And the diagnosis is basically based on the, you can do a genetic testing to confirm for that. Now we're going to shift gear. We just finished the supra tentorial area. We're going to talk about the infratentorial area here. And we're going to go ahead and start on the on diseases that involve the cerebellum and middle cerebellar pedagogy. And the prototype, I think, is cerebral tendinosus xanthomatosis. This is an autosomal recessive disorder. It is a lipid storage disease characterized by infantile onset, diarrhea, childhood onset cataract, adolescent, to young adult onset tendon xanthom. This is the genetic testing you can do for this if you suspect it. But the typical MRI finding, remember, we said now, we are talking about demyelination, dysmyelination. It is infratentorial. So the <laughs> cerebellum is more involved than the supratentorial sobra area. Look here, the white matter abnormality. And one characteristic finding also, hypointensity in the cerebellum, in the cerebellar nuclei. That's very typical of cerebral tendinosis, xanthomatosis. What is the blood testing we can do for that, screen for that? I think there's a fancy damn name. I remember. Cholesterol? Cholesterol. You can ask for cholesterol and the blood and see it will be raised. And you see this is all the abnormal we talked about. Now we're going to talk about the infratentorian confluent, dysmyelation, demyelination that involve the brain stem mainly. And the real prototype is Lee syndrome. I just recently, two months ago, had a patient with typical finding. Uh, of Lee syndrome. Lee syndrome is a somatical disorder, so you expect to see the ragged uh, fibers, as we showed you guys earlier. Most of children are normal at birth, but when they grow up, they have uh, troubles. There's 
stringent diagnostic criteria for the Lee syndrome by Rahman et al. the 1996. And this thing, progressive neurological disease, in all the neurological disorders will have this. Sign and symptom of the brain sleep and Jason Gambia. It's not uncommon for the other disease to have this function. Raise back, take concentration either in the blood or in the CSI. Four, typical finding in neurology or in neuropathology uh, uh, or typical neuropathology and similar activity symptoms. What we care about here in neuroradiology. So look here, this is what's this structure, the vitamin, very effective, the globus, the globus calibri are not affected. You see here, the middle vein is affected, so the typical finding, symmetrical bilateral involvement of the basal ganglia, as well as the dorsal, uh, middle vein or base. If you do the MR spectroscopy, you can see the double peak here of black peak. And this will uh, give you a hint that this is most likely a mitochondrial disorder. This is abnormal to the disorder. Now let's just talk about the hypomyelination or hypomyelinative disorder. We're going to talk. This is the, uh, the one that does not come with typical peripheral, neuro, neuro, uh, peripheral neuropathy involvement. And we're going to talk about lasers, nerves, back from disease. Remember, these on T1, there will be bleeding of the gray-white matter, and in T2, or in T2, there will be uh, more of mild signal intensity increase. So you have to look at the T1 to help you to differentiate. Pelagic cell back of disease, it is X-ray gray system. PLP gene 1, PLP 1 gene mutation is the cause, and the abnormal, the MRI will show abnormal high signal intensity in the T2, look here. It's abnormal high signal intensity. If I tell you this is, kid, is full tear, is this a, a normal MRI for full tear board? Even a full tear. It is not normal because remember, the posterior limb of the internal capsule is not myelinated and it should be myelinated by there. If I tell you this is 34 weeks, 36 weeks, you might say, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it can. But look at T1. Remember, and the, uh, it, there's no hypertensity. There's complete blaring between the gray matter and the white matter. And if you look here, there might be a hint of increased signal of the T1, uh, T1 uh, signal, uh, signal, which is very typical for hypermyelinative disorder. Guys, this, this, if you, compare, if you look at the T1 and T2, believe me, this will help you big time to direct your workout. Now, now we're going to go to the disorder that does, does have typical peripheral nervous system on board one. And I'm going to talk about uh, hypomyelination with congenital cataract. I just saw uh, a kid last week. I think he had this disorder by, by another description of the MRI. It is autosomal recessive. High C-man membrane protein abnormality. This is the gene. I know I don't know how to pronounce it. But if you look at the MRI, there is T2 signal abnormality involving the, the, the white matter bilaterally, periventricular. And look at the T1. Look how helpful the T1. There is a blaring of the gray white matter junction. So we are talking by definition about the hypomyelinated disorder. So we should start the workup for the hypomyelinated disorder. And this is the final. Now, this, who would say this MRI is for the same patient? And who would say this MRI is for a different patient? And if they are different patients, are they one patient, two patients, three patients, four patients, or who cares? Is it for the same patient? Yes. Who, can you raise your hand? Who would raise his hand for the same patient? Okay. Is it for a different patient? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Who would say this is for three patients? The person. Three patients? Three patients. This is actually for two patients. The first MRI here, just Dr. Muhammad Jal showed the, the uh, 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 similar case, but it is not for the same diagnosis. This is a non MRI finding in non syndromatic microphysical disorders, and for me, it looks really 
similar to this one and this one. But this one and this one, Dr. Muhammad Jal just talked about it. This is the latest about the publication about the biotin responsible basal ganglionic disease. And this is the way it looks. If, if, I, if I see this MRI now, at least for me, I would take five of these two differential diagnoses, and they will save a lot of money. Now, this is a 35 leukodystrophy hypermagnetic disorder. This is more a business plan for you, those who want to know all the names. And this is, you know, how you can triage them based on the age. <coughs> and this is uh, some of the tests you can do on leukodystrophy. And uh, I think we're not.